Welcome everyone to this session of the Jim Bregman Invites You To series. Uh, my name's Rob Riley, and with me here in the production crew is Pete Mantell. I will introduce uh, your host, Jim Bregman, who is America's first uh, Olympic medalist, a, a bronze medal in 1964. He has been the president of the USJA. He has been a bronze medalist in the world championships and a whole lot of other th contributions to, to judo. With that said, uh, let me turn this over to Sensei Bregman. Thank you, Rob. Well, tonight we have a very special guest. Bobby Donaldson is an IJF world level referee, and he will give us some insight in what it takes to be at that level as a referee and all of the associated travel and interesting activity that goes along with that distinguished position. I must say it is not easy to become an IJF referee and perhaps Bobby will go through some of the arduous steps necessary to attain that prestigious level. And without further ado, Mr. Donaldson, it's up to you. Basically, my background is I, I retired from the Navy in uh, 2009 after doing 26 years. And uh, I started refereeing in 2010. Uh, I actually joined judo in the early 70s when I was a kid. So I've been doing judo for the better part of close to 50 years. Um, I, I look at refereeing and I look at judo a little bit different than most of my predecessors and some of my uh, soon to be successors. Um, but I, I think my timing was right because uh, my goals in judo were different than most other people's. Um, like I said, I, I spent 26 years in the Navy, but I spent 12 of those years outside of the country. Um, and I did judo all over the world. I always have my judo gi with me. I've competed in all kinds of places. And then, uh, I've never, I never shied away from doing judo. It always seemed to be the one thing that was constant. Um, but the thing about judo is you learn uh, everywhere you go. <laughs> if somebody does judo, they take care of you. <laughs> They're your friend. Uh, you show up at their dojo. Hey, get, oh, okay. Uh, my ship pulled in. I just wanted to do some judo. Oh, please, come. Uh, and they'll show you where all the best bars are. <laughs> they'll take you. They'll feed you. Uh, but I always kept my judo gi in my sea bag for that very purpose, because everywhere I went, there was always, um, always some judo to be done. Um, but like I said, I spent 26 years and after that was enough. So I'll come down to why I became a referee. I never wanted to be a referee ever. I could have been a referee when I was in my 20s. I never wanted to be a referee because I grew up in Southern California and I saw how referees were treated by uh, the, rep the people in charge of the NACA system. A young 25 year old Bobby Donaldson would have hurt, hurt all those referees in LA because I will not be talked down to and they will not denigrate me. I know this about myself. Uh, that's why I could not have been a referee. I, it was nothing to see all the cards on the table and they just throw them on the floor and referees were mistreated back then. Uh, being a sailor in charge of other sailors, I never allowed anyone to talk down to me. So it would have been a problem for a three foot two person yelling at me, I'd have hit him on top of the head and broke the ankles. So I didn't have... I don't want to say the personality. I didn't have the patience to be a referee at 25 or 30 
or 35. It, it took a long time for me to tolerate others. Um, I, 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 I was a senior chief. We're never wrong, ever. <laughs> We're just misinformed. So my personality, is, it was not the same. So I could not have done it. However, um, Sergeant Major, when I retired, he asked me, you know, hey, they, you got enough, you know, clowns being coaches. We need referees because there's, there's not many and there's not many that understand um, the true nature of the force. Um, they're doing it for whatever reasons they have. My reasons were never the same because, like I said, I never wanted to be a referee. But my training, the Navy actually helped me because oftentimes most people in the military will find themselves at some stage working for the intellectually inferior. You will, you will, you will have to work for uh, some lieutenant, some ensign, some JG that your job is to train. But they, they swear they're smarter than you. So you end up having to train them differently, particularly like Naval Academy graduates, they were always my favorite because um, it took you a long time to teach them that just, just because it says this in the book doesn't mean it works the same way. So it, it helped me learn how to do it and be more patient. Now, the one thing I also never liked, ever understood, Referees are unpaid volunteers. There's no money. No one pays your bills. No one pays you to travel. No one pays you for development. No one develops you. This is all out of your pocket. I'm fortunate that my entire life, in, in particularly in judo, I never had to pay the full cost of judo. I. I all of my senseis have been Marines. They taught me judo for free or pretty much free since, a, since childhood, you know, 20 bucks a month or whatever it was. Um, so I never truly paid the full price. When I joined the Navy and I was still competing, the Navy paid for all that, the travel uh, to the tournaments, the, uh, they pay for everything. I mean, I just asked for orders and they send me and I'd go to the nationals or go if I was playing in some foreign country, they just pay for it. So I never had a true, I never paid whatever it cost to do judo. Pretty much. So like I said, I never, I've never paid the true price to be a referee or to, or not be a referee, but to do judo. I had never paid. Um, so when I decided to accept this whole be a referee, try to referee thing, I did it for like three reasons. One, there was no black referees in America. There was like four. And I always found that to be problematic. Um, there had never been a, an A-level referee that was black in America. And then number three, there were no real rule books. So because before I started, I, I looked up all of the, you know, the regulations and the manuals to see what the, per, what the process was. And I realized there was no process. So that means I could manipulate it to whatever I wanted it to be, um, which it was fine. But I've always felt that, that this triangle was always wrong. Uh, what's most important? Is it the players? Is it the tournament directors who give the tournaments? It's the referees. Um, I think they're probably, or is it the coaches that bring the players? So I think it was like a four-legged chair triangle, but for some reason, it's been so skewed that referees are not considered at all um, in the cost of you doing business. You know, I, I've had this argument with USA Judo a lot that eventually in this country, we're in, I'd say in less than five years, we're not going to be able to put on a national event or 
if you do, it will be with substandard refereeing because there's no young people coming into refereeing because young people use their money to go party and start families and everything else. But it costs a ton of money to become very proficient at refereeing. And so, like I said, the referees are probably the biggest donors, benevolent benefactors to American judo. Um, for me, I never was a, nat a local referee. I never was a regional referee. I came in, I started 2010. They said, oh, you're good enough to be a national. We're going to test you for national first time out. And then every time I advanced quicker than anyone else, I went from never refereeing to IJFA in seven years. And that's even before they did away with the uh, PJC level. And I made it to the tour inside of nine years. But it cost me over $100,000 to do, which is where people miss this. You have people who have refereed for 20 years, 30 years. They're, they're spending that kind of money, but they're spending it over a longer period of time. Because I was older, I knew I had to get through these wickets before I aged out. So I would do three, four trips to Europe a year. I would do uh, two or three trips to the Pan Americas uh, every year. I would do more domestic events, evaluation events than anyone else or most people. So I would say I, out, I, I outwork 90% of the people that were doing refereeing at the time. Um, the hardest piece of this is when I started refereeing in 2010, I literally outranked every member of the referee commission. I was already outranking them in judo, but they thought they had the audacity to try to talk down to me or speak to me in a manner in which I don't understand judo. And it took a lot of patience to because you know we're kinder, gentler, um, and they don't realize that they're insulting you, but they do know. Because if you showed up at the dojo and you're on the other side of the line, and I'm on the big boy side, why would you think you could talk down to me or treat me as if I don't understand judo because I haven't been refereeing? When I actually numerically outrank you, it, it's just a conundrum I never understood. Like it's a badge of honor to go, oh, I have an A patch, but you're a Sandan, shut up. You don't get to tell me what judo is. You just know procedures. I've never seen you in a judo gi. I've never seen you fight. I've never, I've been around a long time. So I found that those attitudes kind of were counterproductive to growing the referee corps in general. Uh, and on top of that, they had no education program. They had no training program. So I created whatever, I did whatever I wanted because there was no instruction. So I made up my own. And because I'm, I am, I wanna say secure and I retired from the Navy and I have a government job, I had enough money that I could do things that other people could not do. I could go places that other people cannot go. I lived in Europe for about four years. Uh, I was stationed in Europe. So I knew people there. I, I was stationed in Japan. I knew people there. Um, so a lot of times people just assume that, that they know more or they've been exposed to more judo than you have when they probably haven't. Um, but because you don't brag, oh man, I, I know Jim Bregman. Okay. Yeah, I met Jim Bregman when I was a little kid. I went to one of his clinics. He, I don't remember him beating me up, but then, you know, he had plenty of people to beat up. <laughs> Just because I went to a clinic that Jim Bregman gave does not mean I know Jim Bregman. Well, that's kind of how I find a lot of this refereeing stuff going. So why do you, why would anyone 
want to be a referee. I think that is personally a decision that others have to make for themselves. I became a referee because one, I was asked to be one. Um, it would have been lovely had someone asked me to be a referee at 25, 30. Um, it would have been harder for me, um, but no one was even bothered to ask. No one even bothered to ask me. Okay. Uh, we don't have a single Olympian in America that is a referee. Not one. Other countries do. So it kind of speaks to what we consider important and what they consider important. They're winning Olympic medals. We're not. So why when you have Olympians, we have Olympic medalists that were refereeing the Olympics. We have Olympic medalists that referee the world championships. America has never done that. We don't, our, our Olympians come home, uh, the ones that, that even stay in judo, but no one ever talks to them about being a referee. So it, it kind of throws the pendulum off as to what people think is important. It's, that's why we're always forgotten until you have a tournament Oh man, we got to get some referees there. Well, I have no incentive to help you. I really don't. Um, <laughs> but then the other piece of this that no one quite gets is you have to balance refereeing with family. It, it's hard enough just to go do judo uh, a couple times a week. Yeah, my wife can tolerate that. Um, to travel around the world and leave her at home and um, uh, let her do all the homework and let her do all the taking the child back and forth to school. This is no different than being in the Navy when I go to sea. Um, at some stage, she's going to get tired and need a break. Um, and, you know, people that put judo before their family usually end up in divorce a lot sooner than. Uh, you know, because the divorce rate in the military is extremely high for that very reason. Um, I don't know how to be a backseater. I go out to sea for six months, come back. My wife has done everything. She's used to being in charge. The alpha male in me wants to come in and take over again. All right. Man. Um, I never consider if stuff was running better when she was in charge. <laughs> she figured it out. <clears throat> I come in after six months and I want to change the whole program because I'm back home now. I see refereeing kind of the same way. Um, my wife is very, was very tolerant <laughs> of this. So I made it to A because my wife allowed me to be an A. She allowed me to go to the world tour. She allowed me to do these things because if she had said no, I'd, it would, I wouldn't have done it. Um, so that's the one question that people don't really ask enough of or, or really accept the sacrifice of what it takes to get to the top or not even to the top, just to get there. Um, there are quite a few referees in the world and they all want to do the Olympics. They all want to be on the world tour. So it, they have more supply than they ever need in demand. Um, so you have to figure out how to break through all this stuff. And every person has an opinion and 98% of them are wrong. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm a student. I study stuff. Uh, that's what that's what senior chiefs do. We figure it out. Um, I, I can't speak for the other services, but most most military people that are career, we think differently. We see the problem. We know how to fix the problem. And then we move forward. Um, but that was one of the things. Now. In this day and age, you have only five levels of refereeing, local, regional, national, continental, and getting your full international license. I never felt, never thought that any level of refereeing, I think, is perfectly fine. Some people don't want to be a level referee. Some people don't want to be, con some people don't want to, they, they're just trying to help out. I, I find that 
we don't help those people enough. We don't educate them enough. Everyone always thinks that this is all about advancement. I can't wait to get to A. Well, maybe I'm happy and can only afford to be a regional referee, but I want to be the best regional referee I can be. We don't have a service. We don't have an education program for them, um, which is kind of sad in a country this large. Um, you know, but they're, they're, now the other piece of this is right now, there are three referees that we have that are active, considered active for 2021. Dr. Berliner, who's the IPSA chair, Mindy Buman, who's uh, my, my, my twin sister, the Wonder Twin, she's going to the Grand Slam Paris, and Dr. Moore just came back from the Paralympics. Um, if you look at the IGF ratings, yeah, uh, I'm still on there, and I still um, hold, a, I think, a, like 35 or 36 in the world, um, but I haven't gotten the assignments for 2021. Um, I'm, I'm probably semi-retired now. Um, they haven't officially retired me. Um, maybe I'll get something in 22. Um, but my goal was never to be a world tour referee. My goal was never to be a referee. I just, if I'm gonna do it, I'm just gonna do it better than at the best that I can. Um, I don't particularly, I don't particularly enjoy a lot of things, but I, I always believed in improvement. And I'm probably, um, Mr. Mantell is a, a re, I think retired Coast Guard, I believe. Um, and they, they think slightly different than, you know, I do because they, their mission is different. Um, the United States Navy has been doing underrated replenishments for probably since World War II, where we don't have to come in port to refuel and re reprovision. But every time we do an unwrap, we do a brief. It's the same brief every time, but we continually do it. Every, every brief is always the same, um, but we have them. Um, we do a fire drill every day on a ship, irregardless. If it's in port or underway, we do a fire drill every day because it's training. Um, I see refereeing, and I think one of my, the easiest for me to get, or to make it this far that fast is because I understand training. <laughs> you, 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 you train every day to do the same thing. And the more you do it, the better you get at it. And um, I think that's probably uh, one of the easiest ways to get to get past everything else. I didn't listen to a, I, I heard everyone. I only listened to a handful of people. You know, everyone has an opinion. I mean, all you have to do is turn on the news. They'll tell you everything that's going on. If you turn on Fox, they'll give you this opinion. You turn on CNN, they'll give you that opinion. You turn on MSNBC, they'll give you another opinion. Um, I never worried about all that. I listen to everyone or, you know, but I only really hear a few because I already knew what I was going to do. I, I saw, I saw a gap and I knew they couldn't stop me and they couldn't outperform me. Everyone thinks that refereeing is about, oh man, I'm better than that guy. Yeah. You know, there are plenty of people in America that have, that are better referees than Bobby Donaldson. There have always been, they cannot outperform me. That's the difference. Good in the lab is one thing. Good in the field is something else. There's plenty of referees that are better than I am. More technical, more, uh, more educated, more intelligent, but they cannot outperform me. They just simply can't. Now, give credit to the military. They make me stand up straight. <laughs> they give you a military bearing. They give you a command of the mat how to look at things you're used to you're used to supervising and leading people it's a lot different than than what people think it is so that stuff is easy for me now like i said everyone has to do you know these tournaments to maintain their eligibilities and certifications 
Um, but this is the other thing that people keep missing. It costs me money to do this. It costs every referee money to go get uh, evaluation, to get uh, to, to tolerate, and I say tolerate, um, the evaluators who are there to evaluate them, not educate them, not train them, not teach them. Oh, you did this wrong, this wrong. Gee, thanks. How are we gonna fix this? Oh, I made one mistake. So I spent 800 bucks to get here and I get a lower evaluation because I, I made one mistake. Um, okay. That just means I never come back to your tournament again. Real simple. Now, you the tournament director, you want referees. Hey, I need referees. Well, you need to hire better evaluators. Because if, because if I did one or two things and I spend my money, I'm not going to spend my money for you to chastise me. That is the mentality that we have in our referee corps that I'm paying for abuse. No, no, no. I can go to Costco and pay my money and get abused. <laughs> I can go to Walmart where they won't put an extra, extra uh, cashier up there when there's 400 people in the store. Yeah. So I've, these are the things I think people have to accept as an impairment to recruiting younger people. Other than the money, it is our attitude towards uh, education, towards corrections. Uh, we're gearing not towards performance, but to do error-free refereeing, which is nearly impossible. It's like doing error-free judo. You see two guys that are fighting and neither one of them want to take a chance. It is the most boring thing to watch. It's like watching paint dry. It, somebody do something. <laughs> somebody do something. Well, it's the same thing here, trying to find young people to become referees when we're not willing to fund them. It takes a lot of effort and a lot of time and a lot of money to travel to the different countries, to the different matches to get that experience. Who's going to pay for it? A 30 year old that's just starting out with a family, uh, one or two kids, he can't afford it. That's why you don't have them. And if we're not careful, we will never have them again. We have to figure out how to fund referees. Um, now, Again, I, I talked about this earlier, you know, everyone that comes back, uh, you know, people join judo, they, they wait to get their show on. Hey, I got my show on. You don't see them anymore. <laughs> Same thing, uh, kind of with this whole mentality with the coaching, you know, people will coach, but they have a different standard. So the Olympians come back, you know, the handful that want to stay in judo or start a club or, or whatever. Um, but none of them really consider refereeing. And we also coach to a different standard here in America. We're not, when I was a kid, the job was to develop all of judo. It wasn't about winning a match or winning this match or that match. That's why you constantly see now kids doing what I call Busy, busy, confusing judo, the drop flops, the screaming and hollering, and, you know, oh, Bobby, you're wrong. You should have gave that guy Shido. My guy attacked eight times. If you attack someone eight times and you didn't throw them, maybe you didn't attack them eight times. I don't know. Because you're, you're teaching Maybe you're teaching substandard stuff. Because if you attack someone 10 times, 12 times, and you don't throw them, and you're talking 10, 12 in a row, even if it's 12 to 1 or 12 to 2, maybe there's something defective in your judo as to why you didn't throw them. So why should I, why should I punish the other guy because your judo is substandard? Maybe you're doing a lot of this busy work. I can't tell you how many times, you know, I'm very hard on drop say and I you do drop say and I again I'm your referee it better be good and it better do it better meet all my elements or you're getting a false attack simple as that 
oh man, he had a lot of Kazushi. He dropped underneath him. But the other kid's heels are on the deck. So that means he's not worried about you throwing him. That means that your intent might be just to make him look bad. That's why we don't succeed on the next level because you're doing, uh, you're doing busy work trying to, you know, celebrate winning matches on penalties. No. If, if a person, I know when someone's trying to throw me and I know when they're not. And if you're not trying to throw me, then you're just there to waste my time or try to make me look bad. You should not be rewarded with matches for that. You should give them, give them what they ask for and send them on. Because everything you look at on the next stage or the, the uh, world tour level, they're not playing those games. That's why most people, most of our people don't make it out of the first round. Oh, he got a first round bye. Okay, well, he's in the second round. Then what happens? They're out. Because the rest of the world is not playing this type of judo. It is up to the referees to bring that style of judo to America. The problem is the coaching and the refereeing are not in the same group. Every other country, the referee is part of the coaching staff. Here in America, coaches and referees are enemies. Oh, well, you know, uh, I can't talk to you. You're, you're a coach. But I can go to your club on Tuesday and go to your house and eat your, eat your food and drink beer. But because it's Saturday, I can't, uh, <laughs> I'm not supposed to talk to you. It's utterly ridiculous. And ultimately, it's why we fail. The other countries do it differently. Um, I can tell you because I've lived outside of the country for a long time. Um, which comes down to the same thing. When you look at the local clubs or you know, even if you go to the Junior Olympics or JAJF National, well, it doesn't matter. The same thing happens when two kids work out together all the time. Those matches are boring. And because usually the same judokas or judokas from the same area do a similar brand of judo, um, which may be good, it may not may not be good. Um, the one thing that I loved about being a kid in judo was we got in a van. You know, we had to drive from California to Decatur, Illinois to go to Junior, junior Nationals. We had to get in the car and drive from this place to that place. And um, it was guaranteed that I was going to fight people that I didn't have to fight every week um, in L.A. Um, not that we didn't, we had enough judo in LA to, to, to beat me up forever, but it seemed like we were more, more blended, more eclectic in getting the Florida people, the California people, the East Coast guys in. It seemed like we always seemed to have a lot more tournaments with a lot of people. And I think that's one of the areas where now we're falling down. Um, but for a referee, it's kind of the same way. Um, I need to get better. The only way I can get better is to see better judo, to see a more diverse judo. Um, I have to go to Europe because they're playing a different brand of judo there. I have to go down to uh, Mexico or Argentina or wherever to see whatever brand they're bringing. I, I need to go to Asia to see what the agents are doing. Um, because each one of them brings their own type of judo to the game. Um, and I think that's also where we fall down here. And, and I think that was one of the things I learned uh, that helped me the most is I was able to go to a lot of places and see a lot of things in a hurry. And refereeing is about pre-planned responses. It's not about all the things that everyone else considers it. It's pre-planned responses. Have I seen this before? Yes, this is what you do. Um, that's why the Navy practices a fire drill every day in port and at sea. It is why, you know, uh, when planes fly over an aircraft carrier, there's a missile assigned, it's automatic. 
you're automatically challenging this plane that's flying in the air that's going to go over the vital area. He there's a, there's a weapon assigned it on him at 200 miles. There's a warning that's given. Hey, you're approaching the Navy warship. Da 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 da. Um, same thing with with refereeing. These all have to be pre-planned. So you watch videos, you watch these IJF seminars, and they talk about all this great stuff. And all you're doing is watching a 10, 12 second clip, and you're trying to decipher all the judo that's in that 12 second clip. And, oh yeah, the IJF said this, but you don't get it. You don't get it. Why don't you go to where they filmed that um, scenario and <laughs> referee that turn? <laughs> Maybe you'll see that in a bunch of other stuff because there's always something that's building up to why it happens this way. Um, and I think that's where kind of most of our people fell down and that's where I actually excelled because I treated, I treated refereeing as a, as, a, as a military training exercise. What is, your, what is your objective? My objective is to get here. Okay, how are you gonna get here? Okay. And, I put a PO, A, and M together, and I just did the checklist. Um, so it was no, wasn't nothing magical, wasn't nothing special. It just hadn't been done because, you know, people never can never put real thought into how to do it. Um, so there was always an opening. There's always an opening now. There's an opening now. There's plenty of people that can follow behind me and do exactly what I did and probably do better. Um, but I think that's probably one of the bigger problems is they just, you got to look at it from where, where it is. So the other problem is we have people that measure, want to measure up to other people. Oh man, I'm the, how do you measure success? It depends on what your goal was. Um, Again, I never wanted to be a referee, never did. Um, I enjoy refereeing now, um, but if I didn't referee anymore, it doesn't define me. You know, <laughs> I think I'm pretty successful whether I would have been a referee or not. And if I can't referee again, guess what? I'm still be successful. <laughs> um, even if I could never do judo again, um, dude, I retired from the Navy. I got a government job. I, in society, I'm what they consider pretty successful. I got a 24-year-old daughter that graduated from Georgetown University and now at the University of Chicago. I got an eight-year-old that is already in the fourth grade in the TAG program. Um, pretty successful. Or, well, they are. Um, so it's what you measure and what you consider to be important. Um, I train a lot of people right now. I train a lot of referees. Um, and I tell them all, improve. Don't worry about advancing. I never cared about that. I didn't care about improving. Because if you improve, guess what? You, you always improve. You get better. Um, so I'm going to just talk about a couple different things real quick that I always found to be kind of um, not consistent with judo. Uh, I grew up in a time where if you were 13 uh, and you fought the, you know, well, they, they just told you you're going to that division. And we fought, we fought men at 13 and we fought juniors at 13. And we had to follow the rules of the division you entered, you know, Nowadays, we have cadets, and they're doing all of the judo now, arm bars and chokes. I don't understand. You know, we have people that tell me all the time, oh, well, you know, uh, um, we're going to move her up um, to, to, from 12 to 13. Well, why are you handicapping the 13-year-old girl? You're not going to let her choke her? No. Why are we playing? You moved up. I didn't move down. Why should my rules change? Why are you waiting? Why are you codifying these people? to, well, you know, they're juniors, so we're not gonna have them do arm bars. Well, that's why you lose now. Cause I didn't know any 11 year old kid when I was doing judo at 11 years old, we were doing chokes and arm bars already. That's what we did. You know, they didn't, they didn't, they didn't separate the class. 
you know, hey, we're going to work on our bars today. If you were eight and you're in there, you're doing our bars. So by the time you got to 15, 16, 13, 14, you didn't panic. I see these little novice divisions and, oh, well, we're not doing arm bars under 16. Why? That makes no sense. But you'll, oh, but he's a great fighter. He's a great fighter, but he don't know all the judo. So by the time you put the, the arm bars in, the chokes in, you're already three years behind. So... You know, I, I always found that to be the most dumbest thing ever. Um, you know, so when people, and especially all these other homegrown rules, oh, well, we're not calling this at this tournament. Okay, well, fine. I won't be at your tournament. So <laughs> I'm going to call all the rules. Um, but I always found that to be a problem. Um, that comes down to the personalities of the chief referees, the evaluators, the personalities of the tournament directors. And, uh, and you know, that, that type of thing. If you don't, if my kids are not going to your tournament, I probably won't be coming either. If my kids are fighting in your tournament, I probably won't be coming either, unless you personally invite me. But if you invite me, um, because I, I look at how I, I look at the actual traditions of judo and people keep forgetting that I, I am a seventh degree black belt and I kind of outrank a lot of people. So I kind of you don't get to be traditional when you want to and then non-traditional when you deal with me. Um, so I kind of I don't normally go to a lot of tournaments unless I have a lot of kids that want to fight and I'll go and help. Um, but, you know, again, remember, I never wanted to be a referee. I wanted to be a coach. I wanted to coach some kids. So the bigger thing is, like I said, use your money wisely. Um, I, I don't recommend anyone follow the path that I set um, only because um, it, I had to do it all in a very short amount of time and it, it was very costly. Um, I think people can spend their money smarter. Um, I, I think there needs to be a better plan. And there's quite a few people that could probably make a better plan for refereeing in America to grow the refereeing. Um, I don't think one person can decide it all, but I say that at every different level, every different stage, you're going to need something different. And I think right now, if we don't get our, our house in order, we will suffer the same fate that the United Kingdom suffered and not have an Olympic referee in their own Olympics. This is very close now. I don't see us having a 2028 Olympic referee right now. And we don't want to be embarrassed that way. I mean, this is the first time, 2021 was the first time we didn't have an Olympic referee. Um, it's not Bobby Donaldson's fault. It's not Mindy Buman's fault. Maybe it's the fault of you not having a program, not having an education program, not having a training program. 2018, the United States, for the very first time, did not have a referee at the World Championships, the Junior Worlds, the Cadet Worlds, any world championships of the IJF. That is not Bobby Donaldson's fault. That is all of my predecessors' fault for not having a plan. Their plan is to do this transitional, oh, I'm on the commission this week, that no one thought about long-term. And that's still the problem today. I, I've been arguing, I've been trying to get people on my side, but we need to have the smart people get in a room and create a long range, long term plan to develop the 25 year old Jim Bregman into a referee. Uh, the, the, the 25 year old Pete Mantell, he needs to know that refereeing is a career for him. We need to know all these different people. Um, so that's one of the biggest, my, my, always been my biggest thing for them. I said, uh, the IGF rules are written for IJF contest. Unless you're 
at an advanced stage as in cadet, junior, or senior, that's what the rules are written. That's who the rules are written for. They're not written for recreational players, even if, you know, oh man, he, he's an elite player. He's at the senior nationals. No, he's not. He's recreational. He doesn't do this for a living. These kids do this for a living. They're professionals. The rules are written for them. They're not written for you. So uh, let's interpret the rules to make them more conducive to learning judo. Um, when you call Hajime, there's no more talking. There's no more coaching. Everyone is quiet. Here, you say Hajime, and you know, you know, whoever's going to say whatever, they're going to screaming and hollering at the kid and do a little nawaz. Okay, put your leg in first, Tony. Now put this arm on top, dude. That that that's supposed to happen on Tuesday and Thursday. Um. Well, internationally, that doesn't happen. I tell you one time to be quiet. The next time I turn around, you're getting up out of here. Because, oh, well, ours are development tournaments. No, the dojo is development. <laughs> it ain't like little Timmy can hear you anyway. Because all I remember is when I was fighting as a little kid, I never heard, well, since they never sat in a chair, we didn't have chairs. All you had was the other kids on the side of the mat. They're screaming. I, I heard them. I didn't hear you. Why would I want you to tell the other person what I'm doing? Oh, Bobby, do the Uchimata. Oh, thanks, Sensei. <laughs> he knows it's coming now. Do that move we worked on. Gee, thanks. So I, I go back to the same type of deal. Um, we need to stop the coaching from the chairs. We need to stop it. They need to, I don't care. This is a national championship. It's a national championship. Let's play by, the, by real rules. No talking. Only between Mate and Hajime. And that's how it works. So, but like I said, remember the rules were written for international elite players. They weren't written for the recreational judo players. So, um, sorry, it was a short little concise little thing, but hopefully everyone got something out of it and I would love to answer any questions uh, that anyone has. Uh, Justin Wynn has a question. Justin, I'm gonna unmute you or unmute yourself and you can ask your question. Hey Sensei, I was just curious, you had mentioned age gates. Um, that's something that still kind of eludes me from a knowledge standpoint. I might be able to look it up somewhere, but. Just curious if you could tell me or tell the crew what those age gates for different. Oh, levels. okay. Well, um, right now, according to the IJF, it's 55 for A and 50 for B. According to the PJC, they're saying it's 45 for A and 40 for B. Um, so that means if you're over those ages, you cannot advance. Um, I, I, hmm. I don't think people look at the damage that would be caused if you did a 10 year age drop from what the IGF requirement is to what the PJC requirement is. The PJC requirement will end all refereeing in America um, because people, it takes you that long to be set in life. Because um, men don't, well, I don't know about women, but most men don't really hit their stride in money and salary until they're about 40, 45. So, now, <laughs> you know, so, you know, right about the time you finally get some money and you can travel, um, you're already aged out. So, but the IJF uh, point right now, the age for examination, the maximum age is 55. Um, the maximum age for B for continental is 50. Um, they're, they're, going to, they're still arguing what the PJC requirement is, but I know the PJC has introduced or, or so said they were dropping it by 10 years. So 
Um, Justin, I would say if you if you plan a movie, um, it's gonna it's time to start now. <laughs> start working it now. Yeah, thank you. I, I have no two years to till age forty, and so yeah, thank you. Well, yeah, but you see, you're the perfect guy because you have all that stuff. You're tall. You got that that strong military bearing. That that the strong features. Um, it, there's no people won't try you on the mat. They know who's in charge of the mat. So yeah, you're you're the perfect <laughs> guy for them. Um, Do we have any other questions? Lorenzo has a question. Is it Donaldson? Uh, you mentioned training in Los Angeles growing up. Would you mind sharing which dojos oh, you trained no, at? No, 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 no. I, I grew up in Southern California. So I was always in the, I, every, every sense I had was a Marine. So Bill Dye, um, Joe Rios, and uh, Jesse Jones. And uh, there was a network of all Marines down in Southern California at the time. Everyone was in the San Diego area. So, uh, okay. But all the tournaments, we're in Nanka because Lost, right. most of the most of the stuff we were connected cross connected to them anyway. So we always had to drive two hours to fight. You go there and you know we it was every Sunday, um, and it was Kohaku Shia. I didn't know there was a such thing as a double elimination until I was like ten or eleven. So <laughs> it was always and it was always some little kid that's about three foot two at the beginning of the line. They will get the biggest trophy because he could, he's the only one that can win. Mm -hmm. um, that, but they're the ones that also scarred me from wanting to be a referee because, you know, I saw how they were, how the older referees treated the, they ate their young in LA um, and couldn't do it. <laughs> couldn't do it. Um, so, so I have to say, luckily, they've changed. They're A, not quite as tribal, and B, they're a little bit better with their younger referees now. Well, but there's, but there are no younger referees. That's the problem. The oh, problem. Alec Kacharian does pretty well. Yeah, but I'm, I'm in my, I'm in my late fifties. I'm, I'm done. I need referees that are 25, 30. Right. Um, someone that that can get through the system and be trained through the system, um, and make it uh to grow uh, most people like i said most people don't have enough money to to do this until they're much more advanced in their careers or in their lives and, you know it's hard to tell a 25 year old hey i need you to referee and spend all this money when they ain't got no babies yet <laughs> they, ain't got, they ain't got no mortgage yet <laughs> they don't have a uh, they don't have uh, a lot of money in their 401k yet. Um, you know, it's the same thing I feel about, you know, people ask me all the time, hey, we got a kid referee program here in Nanka. Okay, tell me how, all, let me know how it works out in 20 years when these kids leave to go to university. Uh, oh, we got a program, they'll be back. <laughs> we have guys that have went to the Olympics. They're not doing judo today. It's not more than one. It's a lot. Of them. So if they made it all the way to the Olympics and they're not doing judo, what makes you think one kid or two kids that referee <laughs> for free <laughs> are going to come back for? So, you know, bless their heart. They, they, they're trying. I'm, I'm okay with that. But for me, the data is out. Um, I think David Williams does a program up there in, in San Francisco. He makes all his kids get their national referee before they become showed on which is a great thing for refereeing in the san jose area um but these are college kids they haven't started careers yet um if they come back to judo oh outstanding we'll have a great guy to work with but i'd say when you're 22 23 you should be you should be fighting you shouldn't be refereeing anyway um you know, I, I, I fight. I used to love to fight. I didn't like to lose a lot. You know, it took me a long time to actually speak to Jason Morris because I never really liked him since he beat me a lot. Um, it took me a long time to send him a Christmas card. Um, you know, and then when he dedicates his little, they got, they dedicated a whole street to him. So he sent me the video of me fighting him when we were like, I think it was 85 or 84. 
I thought the match was a lot closer until I looked at it, and he like demolished me. I'm like, dude, <laughs> you just took away, even, even, he, you know, he just made me feel bad. So you know, I never <laughs> like this. You know, me all the time. You know, just remind me. But you, know, you should be fighting. You don't need to be refereeing. You can referee if you need to help out. Um, but maybe we should have a funding source to help these guys become referees. Because, uh, you know, the uniform in and of itself, I'm used to spending 150, 200 bucks on a gi, not, not 300 or 400 on a tailored suit to go referee. Um, you know, uh, what, what 25s, 27 year olds can do that. So um, we need to find a way to help those guys early on, and, you know, get, get them some change and, you know, develop. So yeah, I, but that's why because I'm I'm a, I'm a product of Southern California, and uh, that's all we did was fight. Some great people out there. Let me ask a question: Do they still use Kohaku Shiais intensely in the United States? I don't know. I don't think so. I don't think so. Um. But, you know, it, it, it's just like now you look at the Olympics. The Olympics is now double repertoire. charge. Mm -hmm. You know, before it was single repertoire. charge. Mm -hmm. So if you lost, you had to lose to the guy that was in the finals. Um, Let me ask Lorenzo, you have a different take? Uh, I, I agree. There's not a common Kohaku. North Carolina mm -hmm. and uh, San Fernando Valley in L.A. are the only two I know that do Kohaku. Well, it was kind of interesting because when I was coming up, every month somewhere there was a big Kohaku Chia. And it wasn't necessarily a trophy gig. You just stayed up as long as you could. You learned what you learned. You went home and figured it out. You came back the next month for a Kohaku Chia. In, at the Kodokan, every month, you measured progress at the Kohaku Shiai by how many people you throw. And if you didn't throw anybody, you had to work harder. Then eventually, as months go on, at the Kohaku Shiai, wow, you threw somebody. As years go by, wow, I threw another four. I threw four. Whoa, what's happening? Well, what's happening is you're learning judo and you're not concentrating on metal production and winning trophies, you're concentrating on learning the techniques and you learn the techniques by participating in, in my opinion, Kohaku uh, I don't think that, and this is just an observation and I'm way out of touch with what's going on. But if you go to a tournament today Let's say you lose your first match. Do you have 10 more matches to go? Let's say you lose your second match. Do you have a, another match to go? The other thing that they used to do in Shufu was they'd line everybody up. You'd run the line. Then they'd mix everybody up in the line. Then you'd run another line. So you had more chances at hard competition. And uh, I think that the United States is way behind the rest of the world in so many areas when it comes to judo. And one of the biggest is putting the burden on financing everything on the individuals and not having an organization that's capable enough to go to the USOC, get a large resource, for example, and put in a comprehensive training program for referees like Bobby was talking about. In France, they have 650,000 judo players or more. And they have programs where you become a professor of judo. And it's a profession. So that's just an observation. <laughs> Well, I can tell you how they did it in L.A. is every kid showed up once a year. 
you, they do your height, your weight, and they would come up with an exponent number. And they put you in the line based on that number and your belt color. So if, and you had to win by Epon, you had two minutes or 90 seconds, something like that. Um, and if it wasn't, it was hickey you both sit down. And like I said, they used to run these about every, every week or two weeks. There was always a, a, a tournament. And, uh, and every time you won, your exponent number went up. So now you're not facing the same people. You're in the next group and the next group and the next group. So um, it, it was, it was interesting in that, you know, they didn't actually, I don't know how much, they, I don't remember them charging us for this. They just put your club name up on the wall with your donation, you know, so they just shame money from you. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you only donated, your club only donated a hundred bucks, you know, so, you know, they, yeah, because they wrote your name out and put it on the wall. So, um, but that's how, you know, I grew up in the 70s. So it was, it was just different. Um, I don't know how, uh, I didn't come to Shufu until the first time I came here was 83 when I joined the Navy. So, um, and I found that everything here was just polar opposite of, you know, my reality from California. Um, so, but I think I fought in the very first Liberty Bell tournament too, <laughs> if I remember correctly. Well, that's cool. Uh, do we have any other uh, questions for Bobby? Bobby, do you have any closing comments you'd like to make? Oh, no, no, I, I, I'm, I'm very, uh, I'm very happy that, uh, you know, that you started this program and it can be more of a, um, a conversation uh, as opposed to a, um, I do a lot of Zoom training here right now. I think in the last, since COVID started, I think I might've done five or six uh, different presentations on different parts and values of referee. I don't think anybody ever asked me um, you know, why I referee or if I want to be a referee or how I got started in refereeing. Because trust me, I never wanted to do it. <laughs> I never wanted to be a referee ever. Um, uh, but I, I think refereeing kind of needed me at the time that I did it. And um, I, I just have been fortunate that, you know, I had, you know, Talk more here in DC. I had Roy Engler, I had Carl Tamai, I had Dick Yu. I had a lot of people to for different stages. I had Tad Knowles here. I had I had a lot of people that actually helped me, um, and they helped me because it was good for judo. And I I, I find that that was one of the biggest things the people that helped me helped me because it was good for judo and not necessarily good for them or or a feather in their cap they were just trying to help judo and if refereeing helps judo for them for me I, that's what i'll do I, my job is to help judo um but i would prefer i would have preferred to be a coach um i would prefer to teach um to see if my judo is actually transferable if I can improve upon whatever it is I did, um, I think that's one of the one of the coolest things is to watch some kid that you taught how to do a foot sweep and he comes out and he nails a guy with a foot sweep, you know, you know. And now I'm refereeing and I can't celebrate. I just have to call the pawn. I want to clap. <laughs> I'm a fan. I'm a judo enthusiast. I watch judo all the time. I watched nearly every international tournament. I could tell you all the different players' names. I could tell you the throws they do because I'm a fan. I'm just mm -hmm. like people are with football, or baseball, whatever. The judo is my thing. I, I, so I think that's why I do the refereeing now because it's easier for me because I am a fan. That's cool. Lorenzo, you had something you wanted to say? Yeah, so I don't know if you you realize, Sensei Donaldson, but you've already helped me improve my refereeing um, several times yeah. over. So uh, most recently okay. at, at a, at a <laughs> clinic, 
where Dr. Berliner was the was the chief refer- is the, the chief clinician, but you zoomed in and you gave me some very nice comments. So I just want to say thank you for helping me get better. Even though I've hit that age limit, I cannot go up. I cannot hit a B. I'm already too old. But I but, still appreciate your comments. I still want to get better as a referee, and you're helping me. So thank you. But, you know, that that's the other problem. People always end up saying, oh, well, you know, I can't move anymore, so we won't put no resources. No, the, the biggest thing is that the better you are, the more you improve, the better somebody else can be. Because at some stage, you're going to want to help others um, so you need the most right. current information, the, the most, the, everyone deserves the training, the education, irregardless if you can advance or not advance. Um, because it, again, it, this is about building and growing judo, not, oh, well, I'm, uh, I have the information, uh, whoever, I go to the highest bidder um, <laughs> or, or, or something like that. Because um, the more, the more it's just like the Navy, the more, you know, the less I have to do. That's why I train my reliefs. Um, <laughs> you teach them how to do stuff. So you ain't got to do it no more. <laughs> so no, the, the job should be simply um, anybody that wants the information should be able to get the information um, regardless of if they're, even if they're just a regional referee that'll never test for national, they deserve the same education. They, they deserve the same opportunity to get, um, to understand or, or, because maybe your circumstances, your finances isn't enough for you to travel around the world or travel around the country. Doesn't mean that you don't deserve the same level of training or, or understanding of training. And the other piece of this, I think the bigger piece is just because a person is a high rank doesn't mean they know judo. I know a lot of people that have high ranks in judo. I've never seen them in a gi. I've never seen anybody they t- taught judo to. Oh man, I'm I'm a I'm a eighth degree black belt. Really, dude? What? They, they was giving away when you was coming up. Oh, no. yeah, you know, same thing with you know. I sit on the advancement on the promotion board. I tell you now, I see more packages that do not speak to the level of specificity that I need. I need, you know, like if you're going for eight degree black belt, you need to have a legacy. You need to have a legacy in judo. Oh man, I taught this kid 20 years ago. Oh, wait a minute, hold on, you've been teaching judo for 60 years, you only got one, one student? <laughs> you know, you know. so it's one of those things I'll tell you now is that <coughs> if you want to be advanced to a high uh, muckety-muck rank, and, and I'm telling you, most people in judo, they should have a terminal grade of about, you know, fifth or sixth degree black belt. I, I, actually, I think that's probably where I should have quit a long time ago. Um, but it's not realistic that everyone can be a ninth degree black belt or a tenth degree black belt. Um, it's not realistic, uh, but everyone has an opportunity, but because we're Americans, oh man, man I, I did my time, mm, but did you have the impact? Um, how, how can you be, you know, uh, like I said, we have people come up for the eighth and ninth degree black belts and you're saying, okay, uh, what have you done? Well, I produced this, this, and this. How many referees have you produced? Uh, uh, I've never produced one. Okay. Then you have no legacy there. Because what are you doing to grow judo? If you've been doing judo for 60 years, 50 years, and you've had a club and been teaching, you should have some residual effects. How many referees have you produced? How many international, national, continental? How many players have you produced? How many of those players have gone out after your tutelage and started their own dojos? Um, how many of them are doing you know, wh- where's your network? Because, um, and trust me, teaching judo is very important. It's vitally important. But it's also vitally important if you're talking advancement to, you know, the upper echelons of ranks, that your students are now teachers with their own dojos. 
with that 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 you're still mentoring, that you're still. Um, I, I get it that people can't always travel as you get older, you get sicker or whatever, but you still have to show how you're relevant in today's world, in today's judo. Um, we are a huge country. Only one person qualified for the Olympics in the United States. And the other person got a continental quota from the PJC. Then when everyone had put in the stuff and the people that turned down the Olympics, they went back and they reallocated two more spots to the United States. That is not a legacy for a lot of people to be talking about eighth, ninth, 10th degree black belt. Puerto Rico went through a, through a hurricane, had no power. On the first cut, they qualified more people than the United States. More people. It's because they had the wind behind their back. Yeah, they had the wind behind their back, but they actually directly qualified two people and got one continental quota. Here we are, big, big country. We're America. We're one of the biggest, strongest countries. One person qualified, Delgado. Colton Brown got the continental quota. Puerto Rico had three people, had two qualified people and one continental quota. How can that be? How can that be if we're this, everyone here, is, that's not possible. Same thing, yeah. I, and don't get me wrong, I'm not taken away from um, what all the other people were accomplished. I'm very happy that we had four people, especially three, three women and one man. <laughs> we had more women there than men. And I'm happy for them. And, you know, so I'm not denigrating them in no way. But as a nation, four people out of a possible 14 spots. That's Puerto Rico has a population of 3,285,000. We have a population over 350 million. Yeah, so Puerto Rico's smaller than New York City. Yes. So, <laughs> um, you know, you, you look at Kosovo. Kosovo has won three <laughs> Olympic medals, and all of them have been gold. They won the country 10 years ago. <laughs> they were a war zone 10 years ago, and they got more gold medals in judo, and they've only been a country. <laughs> well, we've been 200 some odd years they, well, they've been about 8 years we can't have 28, 80, 90 200 uh, uh, eighth and ninth degree black belts when Kosovo has 3 gold medals and we don't have, we have 2 <laughs> in 2 Olympics they won 3 gold medals by 3 different people we have 1 person win 2 gold medals um and we've been a country since 1776, last I checked. They just, they just became a country two, eight years ago, six years ago. And before that, they were being bombed. Um, so, yeah, I think people need to be realistic. So uh, I probably went on too long about that, but it's okay. That's okay. <laughs> because they're playing a different brand of judo there. I have to go down to uh, Mexico or Argentina or wherever to see whatever brand they're bringing. I, I need to go to Asia to see what the agents are doing um, because each one of them brings their own type of judo to the game. Um, and I think that's also where we fall down here. And, and I think that was one of the things I learned uh, that helped me the most is I was able to go to a lot of places and see a lot of things in a hurry and refereeing is about pre-planned responses. It's not about all the things that everyone else considers it. It's pre-planned responses. Have I seen this before? Yes, this is what you do. Um, that's why the Navy practices a fire drill every day in port and at sea. It is why, you know, uh, when planes fly over an aircraft carrier, there's a missile assigned. It's automatic. You're automatically challenging this plane that's flying in the air that's going to go over the vital area. He, there's, a, there's a weapon assigned it on him at 200 miles. There's a warning that's given. Hey, you're approaching the Navy warship. Da 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 da. Um, 
Same thing with, with refereeing. These all have to be pre-planned. So you watch videos, you watch these IJF seminars and they talk about all this great stuff. And all you're doing is watching a 10, 12 second clip and you're trying to decipher all the judo that's in that 12 second clip. And, oh yeah, the IJF said this, but you don't get it. You don't get it. Why don't you go to where they filmed that um, scenario and <laughs> referee that term? <laughs> Maybe you'll see that in a bunch of other stuff because there's always something that's building up to why it happens this way. Um, and I think that's where kind of most of our people fell down and that's where I actually excelled because I treated, I treated refereeing as a, as, a, as a military training exercise. What is, your, what is your objective? My objective is to get here. Okay, how are you gonna get here? Okay. And, I put a PO, A, and M together, and I just did the checklist. Um, so it was no, wasn't nothing magical, wasn't nothing special. It just hadn't been done because, you know, people never can never put real thought into how to do it. Um, so there was always an opening. There's always an opening now. There's an opening now. There's plenty of people that can follow behind me and do exactly what I did and probably do better. Um, but I think that's probably one of the bigger problems is they just, you got to look at it from where, where it is. So the other problem is we have people that measure, want to measure up to other people. Oh man, I'm the, how do you measure success? It depends on what your goal was. Um, Again, I never wanted to be a referee, never did. Um, I enjoy refereeing now, um, but if I didn't referee anymore, it doesn't define me. You know, <laughs> I think I'm pretty successful whether I would have been a referee or not. And if I can't referee again, guess what? I'm still be successful. <laughs> um, even if I could never do judo again, um, dude, I retired from the Navy. I got a government job. I, in society, I'm what they consider pretty successful. I got a 24-year-old daughter that graduated from Georgetown University and now at the University of Chicago. I got an eight-year-old that is already in the fourth grade in the TAG program. Um, pretty successful. Or, well, they are. Um, so it's what you measure and what you consider to be important. Um, I train a lot of people right now. I train a lot of referees. Um, and I tell them all, improve. Don't worry about advancing. I never cared about that. I didn't care about improving. Because if you improve, guess what? You, you always improve. You get better. Um, the bigger thing is, like I said, use your money wisely. Um, I, I don't recommend anyone follow the path that I set. Um, only because um, it, I had to do it all in a very short amount of time and it, it was very costly. Um, I think people can spend their money smarter. Um, I, I think there needs to be a better plan. And there's quite a few people that could probably make a better plan for refereeing in America to grow the refereeing. Um, I don't think one person can decide it all. But I say that at every different level, every different stage, you're going to need something different. And I think right now, if we don't get our, our house in order, we will suffer the same fate that the United Kingdom suffered and not have an Olympic referee in their own Olympics. This is very close now. I don't see us having a 2028 Olympic referee right now. And we don't want to be embarrassed that way. I mean, this is the first time, 2021 was the first time we didn't have an Olympic referee. Um, it's not Bobby Donaldson's fault. It's not Mindy Buman's fault. Maybe it's the fault of you not having a program, not having an education program, not having a training program. 
2018, the United States, for the very first time, did not have a referee at the World Championships, the Junior Worlds, the Cadet Worlds, any World Championships of the IJF. That is not Bobby Donaldson's fault. That is all of my predecessors' fault for not having a plan. Their plan is to do this transitional, oh, I'm on the commission this week, that no one thought about long term. And that's still the problem today. I've been arguing, I've been trying to get people on my side, but we need to have the smart people get in a room and create a long range, long term plan to develop the 25 year old Jim Bregman into a referee. Uh, the, the, the 25 year old Pete Mantell, he needs to know that refereeing is a career for him. We need to know all these different people. Um, so that's one of the biggest, my, my, always been my biggest thing for them. Like I said, 